Hello, I'm David. I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre and uh, this is a recording for medical students in 2022 and it's part two of Making Sense of Statistics. Okay, um, first, where we've been. Research questions are about concepts and the relationships between them. This is what I said last time, and they're sometimes about a single concept, though that's rare. It's much more common for the be to be about the relationship between concepts. But um, you need to measure concepts in some way, and they become variables when you measure them, and I draw variables as rectangles, which are nice and well-defined. And how to measure them is not a statistics question, it's a medicine or whatever flavour of science you're doing question. Statistics questions are about variables and the relationships between them. And not about concepts, they're about the variables. Statistics can help you to calculate one thing from the others, but not to decide if one thing causes another thing. Statistics can never tell you whether one thing causes another thing, that's what experimental design is for, but they can help you calculate one thing from another. And what statistics you do depends on what type of question you're asking and information about the variables, because different calculations can be done on different kinds of variables. And these are the types of statistical questions um, and the types of statistics that go with them. There's four main purposes, describe, decide, estimate, predict, and the most common one is to decide the answer to a yes or no question, even though mostly what we're trying to do uh, when we do research is to predict uh, one thing from other information. But it's very common to see lots of hypothesis tests in a research article. And the information about the variables changes the statistical calculations you can do. It depends on how many variables were involved, what kind of variables they are, which come in categorical variables, like whether you have chili in a meal, yes or no, and numerical variables like your body temperature measured in degrees. If you have categorical variables, then it matters whether there are two or more than two categories. And if you have categorical explanatory variables that are doing a job um, of explaining the changes in something else, um, then it matters whether they go with independent groups where every individual has, is in only one of the categories and you measure the outcome once per, per individual or if they go with repeated measures where every individual is in both categories or all three categories and you measure the outcome once for every person for every category. They might, they might not be people, of course. And numerical variables, if they're outcomes, it does matter whether the distribution is normal or not, though it probably doesn't matter much if the sample size is large. So these one, two, three, four, five bits of information go together to help decide what statistical calculations you can do. Okay. And there are 13 common hypothesis tests which were in the other PowerPoint uh, from last time. And I talked about several of them and how you can compare them. But I didn't talk about all of them. And I'd like to talk about some of the missing ones. Because one of the things that I mentioned, which is how many variables are involved, I haven't actually talked about. I talked entirely about things that involve the relationship between two variables. But what if there's only one variable you're not interested in a relationship? And what if the relationship is more complicated and has more variables? I need to talk about that now. So. These are the three, well, let's say four, most common procedures um, which don't have repeated measures involved. The chi-square test is designed to answer a question about categorical variables, where some categorical variable is used uh, to create independent groups and then uh, we're seeing whether that makes a difference to some categorical outcome variable. And it doesn't really matter how many groups are involved, um, it could be either way. And then if you have a categorical variable um, predicting changes in a numerical variable, you can test that with the unpaired or independent samples t-test if there's two categories in the explanatory variable, or with ANOVA if there's three categories. And simple regression um, is designed to find out about the relationship between two numerical variables. Okay. 
So all of these are about the relationships between two variables. And um, I need to figure out what to do if there was only one variable. So these, what, what the outcome variable is makes a difference to the results. These are the same except for this one has a categorical outcome variable, this one has a numerical outcome variable, and for this we use the chi-squared test and for this we use a t-test. And these are the same uh, except that this one has a categorical explanatory variable and this one has a numerical explanatory variable. And we use the t-test for this one and regression for this one. So what kind of variables are involved makes a difference. But also how many variables are involved makes a difference. And we haven't covered that yet. So, I'm just going to pull up this and look here at these ones. If you have a single categorical variable and you're not interested in a relationship between it and anything else, you're just interested in its um, properties. So essentially, if you're looking at a categorical variable all by itself, really the only thing you want to know is what percentage is in each of the categories. And so you can do a one sample Z test for a proportion, uh, which will figure out whether um, a particular percentage in one of those categories is what you think it is. So you might, for example, uh, ask yourself uh, what percentage of children finish all their homework? That would be a, a what's the number question. And if you're, you turn that into a yes or no question saying, is that number 50%, so these are the non-finishers and these are the finishers, um, you could say what percentage of, peop of people are in the finishing category? Is it 50%? Now it's a yes or no question. You can ask the one sample Z test for a proportion. Um, yeah, there's also another test for this called the uh, good chi-squared goodness of fit test. If you wanted to ask your question about a single numerical variable, um, you're not interested in anything that's related to it, you're just interested in the variable all by itself, there's lots of questions you could ask. You could ask yourself about what distribution it is, you could ask yourself about um, what the ver what the spread is, like the standard deviation, you could ask yourself about what the mean is. And the one sample t-test is about concerns questions about the mean. And it doesn't answer questions of what is the mean. It's a test, which means it only answers yes or no questions. So it answers question of is the mean equal to specific number. It's very common in quality control where, for example, you have cereal and it says there's 500 grams in there, though not everyone's going to be exactly 500 grams. And so you could ask yourself, is the mean of all possible cereals produced by my factory, is it really 500 grams like it says it is? And that would be a one sample t-test. Test. So we have here one variable with no relationships, or we have two variables and the relationship between them. Now the question we want to ask, what if there were more than two variables? What would we do if there was more than two variables? Okay, just move this up a bit. All right, I'm going to pop our ANOVA back in here. I'm going to pop our simple regression back in here. Okay. So, if you've got a categorical outcome and you have more than two variables, then you need to answer your question using what is called logistic regression. So, logistic regression answers a predict question. So, if you've got a yes or no question of are any of these things related to this outcome, is a yes or no question, you can still do logistic regression because it will produce, it will produce uh, p-values and, and test statistics along the way. So logistic regression is designed to find out where, uh, the exact relationship between any number of variables um, and a categorical explanatory variable that has exactly two categories. And normally what it does is it predicts the chances, um, the, the odds of ending up in a particular category you're interested in, usually death. Um, yeah, so that's what logistic regression is. And it doesn't matter how many variables are here um, or what kind of variables they are, it's uh, logistic regression. On that note, you'll notice the word regression is used here. Regression is the generic term um, for statistical processes that calculate formulas um, for predicting things. An ordinary simple regression has one predictor which is numerical and one predictor uh, outcome variable which is, which is numerical as well. Logistic regression has 
outcome variables that are numeric, that are categorical. In fact, it will work just as well if there's only one predictor, and that would also be logistic regression if you wanted a formula for how likely it is to end up in different categories. But you can assess this question with um, an unpaired t-test because the computer doesn't know which way around this prediction happens. But that's for the yes or no question. If you want to answer the what's the formula question, you have to use logistic regression. Okay. Well, what if down here you had two predictor variables? Well, that's called multiple regression. This is simple regression. This is multiple regression because there's multiple things affecting the outcome. And it's the same idea as logistic regression. It creates a formula that predicts this outcome from these ones. Um, and along the way, it will do t-tests to ask yes or no questions such as, is this variable related to the outcome? Is this variable related to the outcome? Is the combination of variables related to the outcome? And various things like that. Okay, um, I will say, um, just like uh, with um, logistic regression, you can have categorical predictor variables and it's still called multiple regression. There's just some clever things that they can do um, essentially by calling the two different categories here zero or one to create the formula that we want. Okay, so lastly, um, We've already, I've already said here that it is possible to have categorical variables here as predictors. And there is one very special kind of that where both, where the outcome here is predicted by exactly two uh, categorical variables. When there's exactly one categorical variable making a difference to an outcome, it's called ANOVA. Uh, when there's two, it's called two-way ANOVA because there's two ways to affect the outcome. And theoretically, you could imagine there being such a thing as three-way ANOVA and four-way ANOVA if you wanted, uh, but usually people don't talk about that, and once you get past three variables, you just call it regression. But that's what two-way ANOVA is. That's the difference between ordinary ANOVA and two-way ANOVA. Um, some people even call this one-way ANOVA because there's one way to affect the outcome, which is a category affecting a numerical outcome. If there's two ways to affect the outcome, which are categories, that would be called two-way ANOVA. And if they're both two, uh, it's not called a two-way t-test if they're both um, got two categories, it's still called two-way ANOVA. So, in summary, um, there are one sample, uh, there are one sample tests uh, which are designed to not answer questions about whether there's a relationship but answer questions about whether a specific number is equal to a particular value. And there are ones with complicated relationships with more than two variables and they are all some kind of regression but this one is specifically called two-way ANOVA. Okay, that's that. Excellent. Let's move on uh, to the other things I, we wanted to talk about today. Okay, now we're going to talk about sample size. Sample size is a word that means um, how many individuals or participants you have in your research. Um, and when I say participants, I really should have used the word subject, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the official word here. Um, in statistics, but participants will do. Um, and the idea is that you're sampling them from all the people you could have had, um, and so it's called sample size. Right. How many participants you need for your research depends on the kind of data you have and the method you use to analyze it. And the reason for that is that different analysis methods need different amounts of data to reliably do their job. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a second. I put this very big because it's very important. You cannot choose a sample size until after you have decided how you will analyze the data. Every year, I have students from all over the university um, and sometimes researchers come to me and say, David, could you help me calculate a sample size? And I say, cool, how are you planning to analyze your data? And they're going, oh, I'll figure that out later. I just need a sample size for now. That's impossible. You must choose your data analysis method before you choose your sample size. And the reason is that it's the data analysis method that dictates how much data you need. Different data analysis methods need different amounts of data. And so you can't choose your sample size until after you have decided how you will analyze your data. 
So it's totally okay in this medicine course, in a formative um, assessment, to not have a sample size in that first section. Because if you haven't decided how to do your, what analysis you're going to do, then you can't choose your sample size either. And it's okay to put that off until a little later. First rule of thumb. This goes for hypothesis tests or regression with a numerical outcome. The absolute minimum number of subjects you need is at least 10 individual subjects for every numerical explanatory variable and each category of every categorical explanatory variable. And there's a reference for that um, there um, if you ever want to reference this rule of thumb. So, no one will believe you if you say you need less than 10 subjects. This is the statistical rule of thumb that statisticians have. You need at least 10 for every explanatory variable. So let me just talk about that a little bit uh, with my cards. And it only applies to numerical outcomes. So in this multiple regression here, um, in this multiple regression, I have two explanatory variables, so I'm going to need at least 20 participants in order to do this regression. At least 10 for each variable. This one, I'm going to need at least 30. One for this variable and one for each of these categories. And for this 2A and over, which is essentially a regression, I'm going to need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, at least 50 uh, participants. Now you will probably need a lot more than that, but this is the absolute bare minimum that you need. Um, that's what I wanted to say. For something like logistic regression, it's a little more complicated. Uh, you need whichever outcome you're looking for uh, to have at least 10 times as many um, as there are variables here. So if you're waiting for, for you're looking just to predict the chances of death, um, then you need at least 10 times as many deaths as there are these things, which means if something's rare to cause death, you're going to need a lot of participants. So that's what you need. You need at least 10 times as many. And if I had, if I had something more like this, where there were lots of variables affecting an outcome, I'd need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 80 participants at least um, in order to do this uh, regression. Okay. All right. So if you're doing hypothesis tests, then these are the six things that will affect sample size. The first thing is that if you're going to have things with, um, is so in the middle column I've got the consideration and on the left I've got things that will cause it to be a smaller sample size and on the right I've got things that will cause it to be a bigger sample size. So your type of outcome variable. If your outcome variable is numerical, you will need a much smaller sample size than if your outcome variable is categorical. So if you're doing a chi-squared test, um, if you have chi-squared tests, you're going to need a lot more data than if you do a t-test. In fact, chi-squared tests tend to need like 10 times as much data as you need um, for a t-test. And that's just something to expect. T-test might need 30, a chi-squared test will need 300. The next thing, what categorical explanatory variables tell, tell you to do? If your categorical explanatory variables tell you to make repeated measurements um, of your outcome variable, then you will need a much smaller sample size than if you have independent groups. I mean, obviously, if you've got two separate groups and each of them needs to be about 10, then um, if you've only got one group where you measure everybody twice, you obviously need half. But it's actually, you only need half the size of those groups again. Because everybody is already being used as their own control and some of the extra variability is cancelled out. So, repeated measures tends to use, use about a quarter of the size of independent groups. The size of the difference you're looking for. If you're looking for a big difference, then you don't need as big a sample size. If you're looking for a small difference, you need a big sample size. I'm going to have to talk about that in a moment, but I'll come back to it. The other thing that you need to consider is the variability on what could happen in a sample. 
If there is low variability, then you need a small sample size, and if there's high variability, you need a bigger sample size. And this is going to require me to switch over to the document camera to draw some pictures to talk about that, and it's also going to require me to talk about specifically how some of these um, hypothesis tests actually work. All right, let me just have a chat about the unpaired t-test. It's designed to see um, whether a categorical variable with two categories, um, where, which defines independent groups, is related to a numerical variable. And the graph you would normally draw for such a thing uh, would be this. So you'll have your categorical variable here, which might have categories of A and B, and you'll have your numerical variable here, which will have a scale to be measured on, and then every individual, you will have a dot. So there's an individual here in category A, and they have this number, and, they, and another one has this number, and another one has this number, and you could imagine um, your people spread out like this. but maybe your Bs are spread out like this. And you can see from the way I've drawn my pretend data that on average in general, if you're in category A, your number is higher than if you're in category B. But that's not to say that every individual in category A is higher than every individual in category B. This one's lower than quite a lot of category B. It's just that in some sort of general average sense, one group is higher than another. And so we do actually measure this with averages, and we'll calculate the mean here and the mean here, and we'll say that the mean of uh, in, when you're in category A is higher than the mean when you're in category B. And when you actually do the pair t-test, um, you'll be calculating using those means but you'll also be calculating based on how spread out the data is. Because compare this. Look at this one and compare it to this one. Okay, in this one, these individuals are quite spread out in terms of the number they have. In this one, the individuals are quite close together. And what that means is just looking at it, even without doing any statistics, it's much easier to see that the category you're in does make a huge difference to the number you get, even though the, the actual size of the difference is the same. They have the same mean, but because this one is less spread out, it's much easier to tell which group you're in just from the number. Um, and in fact, all of these people are above all of these people, which is a much more extreme difference than this one. And so the combination of how spread out um, the possible values that the individuals have is, and the difference between their means is going to make a difference to how easy it is to tell whether the category makes a difference um, to the results. And so both of those things work together to change the amount of sample size you need. If I have more individuals um, in this group here, more and more and more of them, so that they cluster together much more tightly in the middle, then it's much more easy to see that you're more likely to be higher in one group than the other. And so that's why you need a bigger sample size when the amount of variability in your individuals is bigger. I mean, ultimately, it's not actually about um, these graphs per se. It's about um, what you imagine all of the means could have been. Um, because remember, hypothesis tests are live, uh, you imagine that you live in the land where the two of them have the same uh, mean. You imagine where for all individuals, the means are the same and people might be spread out like this. and you're imagining all of the possible samples you could possibly have taken. So maybe, by random chance, you happen to choose these two groups, and that will make you think that there's a difference. Or maybe, by random chance, you choose these two groups, which will make you think that they're the same. And so, um, the more variable your individuals are, the more chances there are to accidentally choose uh, groups that are similar, uh, 
And so it's harder to tell if there's a difference from a single um, experiment. So that's what that's about. If, on the other hand, I'm doing... Okay, nope. I'm just going to stay here for a minute. So the way that we actually calculate these is that this is the average for group B and this is the average for group A. And we also figure out the standard deviation, which is a measure of spread. And we use all of those numbers to figure out a test statistic. Something like that. And this test statistic involves um, finding how far apart these two averages are. Now, there could have been other ways for us to calculate test statistics, but our um, friendly statisticians in the 1890s to, to 1930s um, figured out that this is the one that um, has the best properties for figuring out the probabilities using the maths in the background. And so it, it ends up being about the means um, in the end, even though our original question was about a relationship. And so we need to know how far apart these means need to be in order to decide how much of a difference um, we think this is. Um, if I'm measuring people's temperature in the chili versus no chili story, um, then I need to know is one degree difference in the averages between the two groups, is that, is that enough for me to think that there really is a difference? Um, or, or would it only matter if it was there were two degree difference? Or would even half a degree's difference might be enough? That's the sort of question that we need to ask, and that's not a statistics question. That's a medicine question, um, or whatever area of science you're doing. The amount of difference that you see, and whether you care about that, is not a stats question. But you still need the answer to that question to decide what you're going for. Because differences that are small are harder to see. Even though the variability here is low, if those differences were really, if those means were very close together, it would be difficult to see the difference between these two groups um, without a lot more data to see how closely clustered they are. And so that's the two things that are going on. Okay. In the chi squared test, it's a whole different calculation. This one's not so easy. I mean, I could draw a graph if I wanted and have A, B um, for the two groups and yes, no for the outcomes. And then there'd be all these people here and these people here and some people here and all these people here. And I could see from a graph like this um, that it's much more likely to be no in the yes, in the in B category than it is in the A category. Um, and you'd normally draw that, not this way, but with a chart, right? You'd normally draw, a, you'd have A and B and you'd have like a, a yes and a no. And this one would be a, a yes and a no. And there'd be a key on the side that says that this is yes and this is no. It'd be something like that. That's what you draw. And you could see from this information um, that it's much more likely to be yes in the A category than it is in the B category. But in the background, there is the individual people here. So here's the thing. Um, we're randomly imagining that we're randomly choosing people from all possible people here. And if we accidentally chose just the wrong group, just a tiny bit of these side ones, you might think that it would be the same number in um, the yes, in the A, as there is in the B. Um, and or the other way around, if, if actually it didn't make any difference, and it's just as likely either way, and you accidentally chose these groups, then you would think that it was more likely to be no in the A than in the B. And that's what we're interested in. The null hypothesis land is the one where it doesn't make a difference either way. Um, and so we're interested in how likely it is to get as big a difference between those percentages as we possibly, as we get. That's what we're interested in. Um, and so that's how the calculation works. Um, you actually figure out the proportion, they call it, um, in group A and the proportion in group B, and you divide it by 
a calculation, which I can't remember the um, exact calculation. Yes, I remember it. If you combine the two groups together into one big group and figure out the average proportion, it'll be this. Uh, where that, when I say proportion, I mean percentage, but written as a decimal, because statisticians for some reason don't like percentages. Um, so if they see like 52%, they'd write that as 0.52. Uh, the formula will work if everything is percentages, though, um, though that one will become a, a hundred. And then you look this up in, um, in, you figure out all the ways, all the numbers that this could possibly have and how likely they all are, and you compare yours to that, and that gives you the p-value. This is the test statistic, uh, which is, um, I mean, this is a, the, that's not how the chi-squared test works, actually, I'm sorry. This is the z test for two proportions but it produces the same probabilities as the chi-squared test, so that's convenient. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I just want to point out the chi-squared test, what it actually does is that you get your table of how many there are in each group, like, you know, 50 here and 20 here and 10 here and, and uh, 45 here, uh, and you figure out how many you'd expect if the two groups were the same as each other, um, I'm not going to do that, but it would be 50 out of 70. Um, actually, there's 60. The totals are there's 60 and 65 here. So you'd expect uh, 60 out of um, 125 uh, would be that percentage of this sep group of size 70 would be in this box and so on. So if you ever want to know more about the actual calculation, feel free to ask me. Um, that's not what this lecture is about. Um, but the chi-squared test, you actually go this minus the one you expect it to be squared divided by the expected one. You do that for everything. You add them all up and you get a chi-squared statistic, which is a number. Uh, but this one is a Z statistic, which is also a number. And if you look at all the possible things that this could be and look at the probabilities that go with them, you get the same answer comparing um, these two over here, which is quite magical, actually. But in the end, it's the difference between the percentages in the two different categories that you're interested in. That's what's going to cause uh, this test statistic to have different answers. And so you need those two percentages to be far enough apart to be able to perceive the difference um, in a picture like this. The statistics doesn't need the picture and it's a little better than we are at perceiving that difference, um, but that's what we need. And so Again, we're going to have to decide what difference between the two percentages is going to count as important to us. If, um, it's, the percent, if it's the likelihood of death, you've got like a 5% chance of death in one group and a 5.5% chance of death in the other group, does that matter? Is that important? Um, it might be if this is really common um, and it kind of affects thousands and that 0.5% is thousands of people, or it might not be very important if that's just one person. Um, I know it's important to that person, but from a public health point of view, um, it might be less important. So you have to decide how big a percentage, how big a percentage point difference is important. And again, that's a medical decision, not a statistical decision. Okay, and so you're going to have to decide what that is, but it all depends on how likely it is to have different possibilities of choosing different groups. So if um, the true percentage of things, um, if something really does happen about 50% of the time, there's lots of different ways to choose the sizes of these groups. But if something only happens 10% of the time, like in the null hypothesis land, there's like, they're not different from each other, but like that. Group A is the same as group B, uh, but this is really unlikely. Then there's not many options for what you could choose here. And so there's less options for what could happen in an individual sample, and therefore less options for what the z-statistic could be that you are comparing to, because that's what the p-value is. So um, that's the idea uh, behind those things. I just wanted to talk that out. Um, it is okay to ig ignore it if you need to, but you need just enough information to know that it's about the difference between percentages or the difference between means to help you make a decision about how much to statistics, um, how much sample size you need. Okay, 
So if you're looking for a big difference, um, you'll need a smaller sample size. If you're looking for a small difference, you'll need a bigger sample size. If you're looking for low variability, if, if you know there's low amount of variability, um, then you'll need a smaller sample size. If you have a high amount of variability, you'll need a bigger sample size. And actually those two things play, play off against each other. Okay, so you actually only need um, the, the difference to be big relative to the amount of variability there is um, in order to get a small sample size. And if your uh, difference is small relative to the amount of variability there is, then you'll need a bigger sample size. So those two rows combine together. Final thing is um, the significance level, which is the p-value cutoff for declaring a significant result. Um, well. The whole point of this is to look for a significant result. Look for a result that says to you, yes, I believe that it does make a difference. And that happens when the p-value is small. But you need to choose a cutoff for when it's called small. Um, and so if you choose a really low cutoff, um, like 0.0001, you're going to need a huge sample size to get a difference that small. Um, but if you have a higher one, like 0.10, um, it'll be much easier to get a p-value that, um, that's under that. And so there's a trade-off there. And what most people do is choose 0.05 or 5% as their significance level, um, mostly because Fisher used it when he invented hypothesis tests in the 1920s, 100 years ago-ish. Um, the other consideration is power. You want to have a high chance of actually finding a relationship if it's really there to find. Um, those diagrams I drew, drew where you accidentally chose the, the wrong sample um, to tell you the opposite information to what was really there, um, that's what power is about. And so if there really is a difference there, if there really is a relationship there to find, but you accidentally choose a sample that, where the two groups are similar, that's a problem. And what you want to do is have a high chance of choosing a sample where they're not similar. Um, and that thing's called power. Power is the chances of finding a relationship if it really is there to find. Um, and most people pick the number 80%, which feels like it might not be that high, um, but you've got to pick something, and so it's really common to choose 80%. So those last two rows, most of the time it's chosen for you. You just run with the, the standard. Um, but all the rest, um, the variability, that's chosen for you as well. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but you can, and so is the difference you're looking for. Uh, you can decide to look for a bigger difference um, and just know that you're not going to be able to find anything smaller. Um, but you get to choose the way that you measure your variables and you get to choose how to set up your experiment um, most of the time. And so they can make differences to sample size. So, last thing. Sample size calculations with layers formula. Now there are comp Sample size calculations are complicated and they usually need a professional um, assistance and I am not that professional. Um, I've done up to the end of second year in a statistics degree and after that I started studying geometry instead. Um, and so I am not an expert in sample size calculations. Um, so can't talk about that at the Maths Learning Centre. But you can do a quick rough calculation which is called Lair's Formula, um, which you can look up in Medical Statistics at a Glance by Aviva Petrie and Caroline Sabin. And that's a perfectly good reference to use if you want to say that you've used Lair's Formula. And I can help you use Lair's Formula because it's based on all of these things I've been talking about. And it goes like this. For 80% power and 5% significance, it only works for that. Um, there are other formulas for different ones. The sample size you need, need per group is 16 divided by this capital D squared. And that capital D is sometimes called Cohen's D, um, but that um, is calculated in one of these ways. If you're doing an unpaired t-test, you will find the difference in means that you want to find, which is called little d, and divide by the standard deviation. Okay. Cool, and with the pair t-test, it's this calculation. Um, in the middle, it's twice that. Um, and in the chi-squared test, it's this calculation at the end, uh, which is the difference in proportions you want to find, so the little percentage point difference. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me just fix that. All right, that's better. Um, some of the lines in my square roots were missing. Uh, the square root of p times 1 minus p, where p is the estimated average proportion. I'm going to give you some examples of that um, to show you how that works. But they're all calculated differently, um, that capital D, but once you've got the capital D, you put it into that formula with the 16 and the d squared. thing I want to say um, is that that 16, there's very complicated calculations that have gone together um, to produce that number 16. It is not just um, five, it is not just five, uh, 
percent of 80, which is what 16 is. Um, that is a complete coincidence. It's just 16 for complicated reasons. Uh, when Lair calculated his formula, he said, look, I just want to remove all those complicated reasons and give you a simpler formula, and this is what it is. And it's very, very rough. Um, and it overestimates the amount you need a lot of the time um, and whatever. So last thing I want to say is that um, often you don't know enough as um, medical students about the situation in order to know the difference in means you want to find. Um, and that's really difficult, um, makes this difficult to calculate. Also, you often don't know the standard deviation of the thing that you're measuring. Um, what most people do is they do a pilot study uh, to calculate that standard deviation. Um, so they do a pilot study with a small number of individuals, like maybe 10 total, to figure out just no relationships, but just what is um, the variability in that measurement. And you do that pilot study, and that gives you a standard deviation, which you can then use to calculate the sample size for your bigger study. Um, but that doesn't help you get away from the difference in means you want to find. And so as a short as a stopgap measure, um, if you don't know the difference you want to find and or you don't know the standard deviation, you really only need to know what d divided by sigma is. Uh, you really need to know, know how big they are relative to each other. And so what Cohen did is he said that if you get a capital D of 1 where the difference is about the same size of the standard deviation, um, then uh, that difference is called large. Uh, and if you get a difference of 0 0.5, that difference is called medium. And if you get a difference of 0 0.25, that difference is called small. And so what you can do is you can do a calculation where you say, in order to detect a difference of approximately one standard deviation, a large difference of approximately one standard deviation uh, between the means in the, in the two groups, then the sample size you need is 16 divided by 1 squared, which is 16 per group. This is all per group. Ah, last thing I need to say. Uh, which I can do when I switch to the document camera. Is that if you're doing ANOVA, uh, then ultimately uh, the beginning of ANOVA is, you know, is there a relationship at all? Uh, but if you want to test ultimately later whether two specific groups are different, that would be a t test. Um, and so your calculations for ANOVA are the same as the calculations for a t-test. Um, it's just that you've got three groups and that calculation gives you a per group number. So let me do some calculations. I want to detect a one degree Celsius difference in the mean body temperature um, which has a standard deviation of 0 0.5 degrees Celsius um, at the 5% significance level with 80% power um, using uh, T test. Well, I guess I should have said unpaired. Using an unpaired T test. Okay, then, okay, let's see. The standardized difference is the difference that you're looking for divided by the uh, standard deviation. So in our case, that comes out to two. And the sample size per group you need is 16 divided by the d squared, which is 16 divided by 2 squared, uh, which is 16 divided by 4, which is 4 per group. But no one will believe you if you need 4 per group. Um, and so you are going to say, then say, the rule of thumb says 10 per category, and so therefore choose 20 for the sample size. Okay? All right, so that's an example. What if you wanted to detect 5 five percentage point difference um, in the percentage 
of children that cry at vaccination uh, uh, between, I don't know, what do you reckon might affect that? Um, Uh, between private and public schools. Okay. Um, all right, so what you'd need to do is you'd need to have an estimate of what percentage of children generally cry at vaccination. So you estimate, you know, it's approximately 20% of children. Okay. So then um, the D is this so my D is five percentage points which has a decimal of 0 0.05 my estimate is 20 percent and the 1 minus P is the other percentage the 80 percent and that calculation is whatever it is And so the sample size is going to be um, 16 divided by 0 0.125 squared, which my calculator says is 1,024 per group. As I said, um, Chi-square tests tend to need at least 10 times as many uh, or more than you would expect for a, a um, t-test. Okay. So these are the sorts of calculations you can do. Um, and there are other, uh, if you want to talk about how to do them, feel free to pop into the Maths Learning Centre or check out some of the other videos.